Dying, Christ destroyed our death. Rising, Christ restored our life. Christ will come again in glory. As in baptism, Jim Connor put on Christ. So in Christ may Jim be clothed with glory. Here and now, dear friends, we are God's children. What we shall be has not been yet been revealed. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. Those who have this hope purify themselves as Christ is pure. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am life. To those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of hell and death. Because I live, you shall live also. Friends, we are gathered here to praise God and to witness to our faith as we celebrate the life of Jim Franklin Connor. We come together in grief, acknowledging our human loss. May God grant us grace that in pain we may find comfort, in sorrow, hope, in death, and resurrection. Let us pray. O oh God, who gave us birth, you are more ready to hear than we are to pray. You know our need before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Give to us now in your grace that as we shrink before the mystery of death, we may see the light of eternity. Speak to us once more your solemn message of life and death. Help us to live as those who are prepared to die. And when our days here are accomplished, enable us to die as those who go to live forth. So that living or dying, our life may be in you. And nothing in life or in death will be able to separate us from your great love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear these words from the psalm, Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my cry. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. If thou, Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and his word do I give hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord is great mercy, with his plenteous redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all their sins. From Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 through 31. Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is an everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youth will faint and be weary, and the youth and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And from the New Testament, from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, hear these words. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received and which you also stand through all, which also you are being saved. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have died in Christ have perished. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died, the sum of the last. How are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Fool. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And as for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but as a bare seed, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown in a physical body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. When this perishable body puts on imperishability, and this mortal body puts on immortality, then the saying that is written will be fulfilled. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? 
be thank, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God.
splitting wood. I'll never forget how we got into that business. It was after a barbecue, and we was going to make some money. And uh, they said, well, we'll sell what firewood is, what wood is left over. I said, uh, we sold some, and then people started calling and wanting it. Well, Jim wasn't going to let an opportunity buy to help Methodist men. So we got into the wood splitting business. And uh, we were going to go down and uh, a tree had fallen and we we're going to cut it. And uh, uh, for some reason, Sandra, my wife, and, and uh, Martha, Sue, and Gwen were there. And uh, Jim, we, Jim and George and I started to leave and I said, well, the three musketeers ride again. And I won't say which lady said it, said it looks more like a three stooges. <laughs> <laughs> but when you spend hours with people, you get to know them. You get to know the real person. And I spent hours with Jim. And I know I was his friend because I'm going to let out a little secret hand. <laughs> You really know someone has accepted you when they'll cuss in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> and our friendship reached the point where you could cuss and not say, excuse me, preacher. He is one of the most, most upright man man. We ask why. Ecclesiastes chapter 2. For everything, there's a time and there's a purpose. It was Jim's time. But we make false assumptions. In just about every church I have gone to, have had the pleasure of serving. I've always had someone who was an expert in English. And I won't point out Bob or Martin, but <laughs> <laughs> and she is not the one who done who, who did this. I you know how you like words because they sound just neat rolling out of your tongue. I love the word irregardless. And uh English professor, college English professor came up to me and said, there is no such word as you are using. I said, you're kidding. She said, no, go look it up in the dictionary. And I did, and it wasn't in there. And I would like to nominate one word that is not a word. You have used it, I have used it, we all have used it. <laughs> And that is L-O-V-E-D. Loved. Past tense. Because you see, in the Bible, God is plain. If you go to 1 Corinthians 13, you read 15. 13 is what I have based my life on. Though I speak with the tongue of men and angels and have not love, I have become as tinkling brass or a sounding gong. Though I give my body to be burned and I have not love, it profits me nothing. And then it goes into what love is. Love is kind. Love is gentle. And right near the end, it says something that we often forget. Love never ends. Love never ends. If you think Jim loved you, he still loves you. <laughs> To we who believe in Jesus Christ, there is no past tense to love. There is only love. His body died, but Jim's love did not. Oh, could this man love. Oh, thinking of the people he loved and the things he would say. He loved people. Now, this might come as a shock to you newcomers, but years ago, every once in a while, there'd be a slight disagreement in the church. <laughs> and I'll never forget what Jim said one time. We were going into church council, and Jim said, Well, I don't think what I want's going to happen, but all I want is my say. 
Let me have my say and I'll be all right. Love, peace. And I'll never forget, I was sitting back there in the office, phone rang in the gym, he said, Wayne, he said, I got me a dog. I want you to come see my dog. And so I said, okay, I'll be up there in a little while. And I went, and while I was going, you know, I was wondering, is it a German Shepherd or Doberman? You know, what kind of dog did Jim Conn have? <laughs> <laughs> and I walked in, and Jim said, me a cinnamon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think cinnamon ever weighed three pounds at any time. But did he love that dog? But he loves people more. He was not afraid to say it. He loved you. The last time I talked with Jim was right outside of the store a few months ago. He hugged me and said, Brother, I love you. We need to learn that to tell people we love each other. We never know. And he would support you 100% if he believed you were right. My son is here this morning, Ben, who's been a Methodist minister in how long? 15 years. 15 years. You know what church he came out of and who was his biggest supporter here? <laughs> he came out of this church and it was Jim Connor who spearheaded it. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I never did see Jim that mad, but if someone had said something against Ben going into ministry, I believe I would have seen a hissy fit. <laughs> he still takes credit for being being in the ministry. He taught us how to love. Not in so many words, but what he did. Coming down here, I have a lot of memories, and I could talk probably to about three o'clock about the things we did and the good times we had. At this church, I had a relationship with a band of brothers that I had never had before or since. Something very special. And the experts say, I don't know who they are. I tried to find out who is an expert. I haven't found one yet. But the experts say, if you can have two good friends in your lifetime, someone that you could call any time and they would come, you are a blessed person. He said you can count them on your right hand. Well, Jim Connor's on this right hand. Okay? I could count on him. I could count on him. Didn't matter if he's serving communion on Christmas Eve, splitting wood, or whatever. I could count on Jim. He is my friend. And we can celebrate his life. God can we celebrate his life. But that's what this is, a celebration of his life. But like I told you to start with, I don't feel a whole lot like celebrating. So many questions when someone dies. God said there's a time to be born, there's a time to die, and we just have to accept it. That's just the way it is. But questions. You know, sometimes we forget how important the resurrection is. How wonderful it is. Like Hank read, if Christ be not risen from the dead, we're in trouble, friends. Do you think you've been in trouble before? If Jesus Christ was not risen from the dead, you're in more trouble than you can ever imagine. But he did. And Jesus, when he was facing his own death, and he looked over that sorry bunch of disciples who had been arguing over who's the greatest, he looked at them. And he knew that he was going to die shortly. 
And he said those words that are so beautiful and mean so much. So let not your heart be broken. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, would I have told you I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you unto myself, that where I am, you will be also. Where's Jim Connor? He's with Jesus. Isn't that what Jesus said? He said, I'll come get you. And he did. In Augusta, Georgia. Is Jim alive? Going back to the garden, the resurrection is so important, but we forget sometimes so many questions about death and the questions in the garden. The questions Jesus asked. Remember Mary standing there crying? And he asked her, why are you crying? She said, because death has came. Death is here. It took my master. And then there's that next question. The question I just love. Have you ever done something stupid? <laughs> if you'll raise your hand that you have never done something stupid, we will declare you the big liar in the sun. <laughs> okay. So if you want that title, go right here. Jesus turns to Mary and instead of saying they are there, he asked a question. You know what that question is? Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's not dead. And that is what Jim Connor is. He's alive more than he has ever been. More than he has ever been. He's in a place. He's in a place, the Bible tells us, that eye has not seen, nor ear heard, or the human mind even imagined. And you know, we, we have pretty good imagine, imaginations, do we not? I still imagine myself playing shortstop for the end. <laughs> I can do that by imagination. But God says there's something prepared for you, and it's beyond your wildest imagination. You know, there's a lot of wonderful things, are there not? I'm old enough to retire. Okay? I'm not young. And thinking back to my youth, there is no way in the world I could have even imagined what Ben taught me into buying. He taught me into buying an iPad. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think back when I was in high school in the early 60s that I could have even imagined an iPad? <laughs> I can't see me with one now because that darn thing is... But get you one because of Siri. Okay, Siri is a very smart girl. <laughs> Siri is smart. But I could not imagine it. But that's where Jim is. Something beyond our wildest imagination. So can I celebrate? You doggone right I can. I can't celebrate the hurt in my heart. I can't celebrate the tears. But I can celebrate where Jim Connor is this moment. This moment. In the words, let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. All praise to the Lord God Almighty. I shared a few of my memories at this time. Is there anyone here who would like to share memories or something they would call about Jim? 
I'm retired, I got all of that. <laughs> I can remember dancing with him at the last Valentine's banquet, and then he was here some week ago, usher the church. Jim was doing the things that he always loved to do, and I know that he's just dancing with him. When he and Gwen moved across the street from us, it was the best neighbors we have ever had. And the love that we share, it was just amazing to me. I had never had neighbors like that. And like you said, he would keep the shirt off his back. He would do anything. <coughs> he was a man that everybody loved. And that to me is, it just says a whole lot about a person. You know, it would be impossible to summarize what Jim Connor <coughs> did to this church and to this community. He was always there. You could always count on him. <laughs> and recently, uh, if we needed something, somebody went to jail. And invariably, he would pledge something and call me. <laughs> <laughs> he said, we need so-and-so done, and I pledge $500. You're going to give $500, aren't you? But well, you couldn't say no. Not to Jim, you know? Because he was always there and always doing. And he is just, he is really going to be missed. Really going to be missed. Uh, he recently told me, he said, you know, he said, I've been blessed. He said, God blessed me with two wonderful women in my life. Mm -hmm. and he realized that. He realized how blessed he was. I loved him. And he loved me too. Excuse me. He is. Oh, I love him. <laughs> and he loved me. <laughs> admiring him all of these years was really a joy and a pleasure to me. Well, most of y'all know me. And I'm the great son-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> old Mr. Jim didn't hold no punches with me. And Y'all seen the great side of them, and I'm a Yankee, and he's a Southern boy, and I keep trying to convince him I was only up north until I was seven, but that didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> you're, up there, you're Yankee, and he inherited something from Granddaddy, which some people inherit things that are good. But Granddaddy would hold the children's heads and thump. <laughs> and he adapted that technique on me on a regular basis. <laughs> I would come to church on Sunday and he'd fix my collar, fix my coat. Robert Turgeon took care of that today. And he'd get me all straight and then he would <laughs> He definitely was there for me throughout my whole life that I got to spend with him. And as he got older, well, he didn't fix things too well. And I can't tell you how many times he drove old granddaddy's pickup truck to the house with something broke in it, and he'd say, fix this thing, because I about lost my religion. <laughs> Now, I never heard him cuss, but I heard him say he's going to lose his religion so many times lately because he couldn't get something to work. If it was supposed to start, he expected it to start on the first pole. And if it didn't, it was broke. That's just the way it is with him. Loving that man was easy. It didn't have to, you didn't have to try to love him. It just came natural. He helped the children, the Easter egg hunt, the Boy Scouts, 
He cooked hot dogs. The whole church knows all the things that he did. Just got through putting two new stoves in the men's and the church in there. I mean, John Rickman carried the old ones off and got the new ones. He said, John, I guess we need to get new stoves and let's do it. And they just did it, you know. And they, together, they're a team. He was a team with any member of this church that needed him. He loved to garden. He taught me to garden. I'm a Yankee, so I don't garden. <laughs> And he taught me how to garden, and I think I grew a bigger tomato than him this year, and I don't think he liked that, but uh, I had to show it to him. And I'm not a great fisherman, that man could, could catch fish uh, at any stream, and the first time I caught a fish, I, I ran over to his house. Yvonne was there, it was late at night, and he said, you know how to, I said, I don't know how to clean it. He had to show me how to clean it, and then after we cleaned it, he dumped me. <laughs> I'd like to say I love that man more than anybody, but that would be a lie. But to tell you that I didn't or wouldn't have done anything that man ever asked me to do. I love that man so much. And... Uh, <clears throat> I suspect that all the men at the men's group will take their round and make sure I keep getting smacked or thumped. That's for sure. And uh, I'm grateful that he was a part of my life. I think he obviously gave all of us more than we gave him, but he was a great man. I didn't know Jim very long, probably 10 years, but uh, during that time, we. We became close. It was a sort of a like a been referred to a band of brothers or some certain. Uh, well, we fished together, garden together. Uh, he referred to us as my sharecropper. I asked him one day when he was going to do his share of work. I mean, he was, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, Jim was the kind of person you'd call him and tell him you had some vegetables that uh, come over and get so and so. He says, Are you pig? I, he, yeah, I got some pig. He, he said, Well, I'll come one day when you don't have a pig. He says, If I can't pick them, somebody else grows them. I don't want them. He was just that type of person. We were uh, fishing one day, and uh, first time we went, we got out the edge of the slam. He said, Alfred, do you know how to get back? Come here. I said, yes, Jim. This is so I've never seen anyone who was so relaxed in nature. It was like a, like a small child of innocence. He just did just something came over him. He was so relaxed and just at peace with himself. And I marvel at that. And uh, the guy that was with us uh, has commented about it, how They've never seen anyone seem so relaxed and so comfortable in his own being as, as Jim was. And I will tell you that he told me after that trip that he had learned several cuss words that day. I want to ask y'all something uh, before I sit down. I've always wanted to do this. If you've ever been to a funeral and heard anything bad said about anybody, <coughs> That's impossible today because uh, Abraham Lincoln was talking to his cabinet in late the Civil War, and they were all trying to figure out what they wanted to have on the obituary or the tombstone. And he made a statement to them that no matter what they accumulated, no matter what fame, glory, prestige, wealth that came to them in their life, that the size of their funeral will be determined by the weather that day. Think about that. <laughs> that uh, I think everybody that's seated right here today on this sunny morning would be here today for Jim Connor if it was storming outside. And what a testament, and I can only thank Jim for the memories.
only person in this church that knew him longer than I did was his sister Ruby. To y'all, he was Jim. To me, he was Frank. <laughs> At the time, I was three years old. His daddy was Jim. But he was Frank. Unless you were angry with him, then he was Franklin. <laughs> you all know him different than I do. But I've heard some wonderful things about him, and all the things that I've heard are true. The only man to me when I was growing up was greater than my daddy was Frank. <coughs> and when he loved, he loved with everything, and I said love, <laughs> with everything that was in him. That's the only way he knew how to love. <coughs> that's a godly love. Not everybody can do that. But he could. I love that man. He was good to my sister. Oh, and did he love to pick it up and get a rise out of her? And when she passed away, he called me one day, and there was something in his voice that I thought, what's up? Well, I had seen him a couple of times with Miss Yvonne in the store, and when I go up and hug his neck, she'd take off the other way, and I thought, ooh, I think there's something going on. <laughs> <laughs> and from his voice, I think he was afraid to tell me for fear of what I would say or the way I would react. And finally he said, well, I'm just going to tell you, I'm getting married. I said, well, that's wonderful. <laughs> and it caught him off guard, and he didn't know what to say at first. And he said, you don't mind? And I said, I think that's wonderful. I said, when God made man... He said, he looked around and he saw everything had a, a mate but man. And he said, well, it's not good for man to be alone. And I think it's wonderful that you have found someone. So then he told me all about it. <laughs> and I was so happy for him. And I was so happy for her. Because I knew that he was going to be just as good to her as he had been to my sister. And you can't help but love somebody that loves that way. He was and still is my hero. When I first came to United Methodist Church and I started doing a Bible study over in the, the fellowship hall, Jim and Gwen were honestly those people that were going to be there every Tuesday night. Jim had a hunger, Jim and Gwen had a hunger for the word like um, Claude and Mary Beckett's doll, if you remember them. Those were those four that, and, and of course, Jude, that I knew were going to be there because he loved the Lord and he wanted to, he wanted to be taught the Word of God. And so that's when I first met Jim. And uh, then when I was allowed to minister here, Jim would always say, Brenda, you know, I really do like to hear you preach, but I don't want to hear you preach. I want to hear you pray. And so Jim made me promise every time that I ministered that I would pray at his funeral. So if y'all will bow your heads, I want to keep my word to Jim that, okay, Jim, I'll, I'll do that. Because that's what he loved. He loved me, like everyone says. He, he loved me. There's no doubt when, when Jim was around you that you could, you not only, not only did you know that you were in his presence, but you knew that the presence of God was also there. That, that he just emitted love. And that's what God is. God is love. Jim was love. So I think what the sister-in-law was saying, probably <coughs> the best word to describe him was Frank. I mean, we've all called him Jim, but I think we should have been calling him Frank. <laughs> because that's the way it was. If he frankly loves you, he loves you. If he frankly doesn't care for you, you knew it had. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what? I appreciate people being honest. So I want to be honest and I want to keep my word. So if y'all will allow me, Pastor, can, can I pray? Got it? Yvonne, can I pray? Yes. All right. Father, I thank you that you, you give me this opportunity. And for I, I do lift up this family to you. And I thank you for that we can all stand here and 
of the love that you have for us. That you loved us so much that you gave us Jesus. And Father, I thank you for Jim. I thank you that for the life that, that he was your servant. That you called us to serve. And Father, I thank you that he fulfilled, he fulfilled that call, that mission, that commission that you placed on his life. And Father, I thank you that as we look at Jim, as we look at Frank, we can do that as you've taught us as this example with, with Jim. And Father, I thank you. I thank you for the times that, that we've spent together in studying your word, in learning more about you. And Father, I thank you. I thank you that Jim has, he's finished this race. He, he's run this course. And now, Father, I thank you that you looked at your son and you said, well done, my good and faithful servant. And Father, I thank you. I thank you that, that you open doors. And Father, I thank you for this opportunity to be a part of the celebration of what Frank Jim has done on this earth. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I thank you all for, for sharing these words. It's a, uh, I, my first day here on, in Midway, I, on Wednesday when I moved in, uh, they mentioned about Jim and talked about how great a, uh, every man that came through mentioned his name and then talked about how great a man he was. And, uh, the service has helped me to see how great he was and, and how much uh, he'll be missed here at Midway United Methodist Church. So I appreciate all the words that have been shared. I imagine they'll be being shared for many, many more years to come. As someone said, uh, started talking about forever, we, we might be here for quite some time, and, uh, and I think that that will be true for many years to, to come. So let us uh, stand and, and receive the, the dismissal. Now may the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, make you complete in everything good so that you may do his will, working among us that which is pleasing in his sight, for Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>